Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next uh, session of 3C QFS. This week, this week we have Ioannis Solanidis. I think that's who pronounced uh, your name. <laughs> um, from Macquarie University. We'll be speaking on the kinematic, energetic, and thermodynamic properties of regular black holes. Ioannis um, studies black hole thermodynamics, I believe, um, has a, a strong background here. So I'm very interested in, in learning more about Ioannis. Uh, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Paul. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to do this seminar today. And uh, I'm going to talk about some properties of ultra compact objects and specifically about uh, regular black holes. And my goal is to generate some discussion and interest uh, in the topics that we have working on. So ultra compact objects are objects that are compact enough to have a light ring. And we know that uh, such objects exist in nature and we have photographs from the Event Horizon Telescope, but their nature remains obscure. So typically, we model objects like that using the Kerr paradigm. We expect such objects to rotate. So we're using the Kerr paradigm to compare observations from light rings and quasi-normal modes. So one of the possibilities is that this paradigm is actually uh, the true uh, paradigm, the true nature of these uh, objects. And we have singular black holes as one of the possibilities. Uh, that means that we have event horizons and we have uh, singularity. Uh, both these features are not good because singularity signals the breakdown of uh, general relativity and horizons uh, basically cannot be observed with quasi-local means. We can not design an experiment that will operate for a finite duration of time within a finite region that will actually determine that an event horizon is present. The second possibility that we can have is regular black holes, and these are objects that don't have any singularities but have horizons. Uh, so we expect that these uh, objects should be an outcome of uh, quantum gravity theory that regularize uh, the singularity. Although I should mention that uh, these objects are not uh, perfect, their stat is showing that their uh, mass inflation instabilities associated with the inner horizon, at least in static cases. Uh, and the third case is basically horizonless configurations. So we can have objects that don't have horizons or singularities. Uh, they're not perfect either. They have uh, an inner light ring that uh, is stable, and this creates some accumulation of light, and later on this creates some kind of instabilities. So during this talk, I will mainly focus in regular black holes and horizonless configurations, and this is mainly for two reasons. One of the reasons is that we expect to have um, objects without singularities in our nature. And the second reason is that I can conveniently parameterize using one single parameter, both of these uh, types of objects using one metric function f of r. So I will break up my talk into two parts. We will have uh, static scenarios initially, and then I will proceed with some dynamic scenarios, and I will conclude with some uh, thoughts and the summary of my results. So in the absence of uh, quantum gravity theory, uh, we need to find a way to actually source these types of objects and effectively study the properties of them and see if we can actually get some insight of what are the actual properties of a quantum gravity theory. So in the case in the in GR, in general relativity, we can actually source these geometries using nonlinear electrodynamics. We can use also modified gravity like uh, Einstein Gauss for corrections to the Hilbert to Einstein Hilbert action uh, with a scalar field to have non trivial contributions in four dimensions. And also, loop quantum gravity, which is a quantum gravity theory, uh, basically can have uh, solutions, regular solutions. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on the first case. So, I will have uh, general relativity coupled to an NED field. And uh, NED theories have been successful in the past eliminating singularities associated with the uh, point charges, electric point charges, and before QED. And apparently they can do exactly the same for gravitational singularities, but at the cost of introducing a magnetic charge. So I will focus only on magnetically charged solutions. There will be no electric charge, 
And in this case, I will have a four potential that has this form uh, with uh, QM being the magnetic charge. And we'll have an action for this theory. We have the einstein Hilbert action. We have uh, cosmological constant lambda if present. And we also have uh, the NED Lagrangian density, which depends on the field strength F, which is given by the contraction of F nu nu with itself. Now, I should mention here that uh, there are many NED theories that also depend on the dual, on the Hodge dual scalar. But for the geometries I'm going to study today, uh, all of them are being sourced by uh, dependence only on the field strength F. So, I'm going also to restrict in spherically symmetric cases and specifically the ones with uh, the line element uh, of this form. I should mention that this is not the most general case you can have. You need two functions to actually determine uh, to have the most general case in spherically symmetric cases. And I'm going to use uh, three specific models to demonstrate some of the properties. And the first one will be the Hayward model. So the Hayward model has uh, this metric function, and we see two parameters. We have the parameter M, which is the Comer mass of the spacetime, and we have a parameter L, which is the minimal length scale introduced to regularize the spacetime. So when L goes to zero, immediately we retrieve the usual uh, Svartu, singular Svartu metric. The NED Lagrangian in this case is given by uh, this form where alpha is an extra parameter introduced. And the interesting thing here is that the weak field limit as we go, as we take F going to zero is F to the power of three over two, which is stronger than the Maxwell limit. And this will affect also the asymptotic behavior. And I will speak about the, the, the properties of this behavior later on. And we have two parameters, alpha and the magnetic charge QM that are given in this form in order to source the Hayward model. The second model uh, I will consider is the Bardeen model, which is actually the first regular black hole model that was proposed in the literature. And it has similar features with the Hayward model. We have uh, the parameter M, which is the Comer mass, and we also have a minimal length scale L to regularize the space time. We have a different NED Lagrangian. And the weak field limit, now it's F to the power 5 over 4, which is, again, stronger than the Maxwell limit, but it's uh, weaker than the Hayward model. So we have different parameters that source the Bardeen model. And the third model I'm going to consider is uh, a model proposed initially by Fan and Wang, but all these NED Lagrangians are basically uh, specific cases of the Fan Wang metrics. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, the name for uh, Cadoni model as the name because it was used later on to observational to provide some observational constraints uh, on this particular model and also to this, to make it distinct from Hayward and Bardeen. So the interesting thing about this model is that the weak field limit is uh, the Maxwell limit and this is a behavior that we want. We expect that if a theory is described by an NED um, Lagrangian to go to the Maxwell limit uh, for small field strengths. And the parameters here are exactly the same as the, the one introduced for the Bardeen model. And I want to give you an idea of how this works and how we can parameterize different type of objects but just by varying a single parameter. So in this case, uh, in this case, I will consider the Cadoni model and we have a critical length for mass equals one is eight over 27. So if we take minimal length scales, which is less than this value, uh, let's focus on the blue line. Uh, you see that we have two solutions, R minus and R plus. So R minus will represent the inner horizon and R plus will represent the outer horizon. And the region in between is basically uh, F of R is negative there. And this means that the expansion of the outgoing null rays will be negative there. And this signals the presence of a trapped region. So um, in this case, when the minimal length scale is less than this critical length, we have horizons and we have a trapped region. And this geometry represents a regular black hole. And imagine now that we start increasing the minimal length scale, then R minus and R plus will get closer and closer together until we reach this critical length, which is the orange line. And this uh, corresponds to the case that R minus and R plus will coincide. 
And now we will have only one single degenerate horizon and uh, there is no trap region anymore. So this represents an extremal regular black hole. And the last case is uh, when we start, we increase the minimal length scale more than the critical length. And in this case, you see that f of r remains positive uh, for the entire uh, region. And that means that there is no trap region and there is no horizon. And this represents a horizonless ultra compact object. So just by varying the parameter L, we can parameterize both uh, regular black holes and horizonless uh, ultra compact objects. And regularity uh, for from the assumption of regularity, we need to have f of r to go to one uh, for r equals zero. And now we'll proceed with the study of thermodynamics first. We know that uh, objects, black holes specifically, have uh, thermodynamic uh, properties, and these originate from some, uh, possibly from some microscopic description of degrees of freedom. And there are uh, many ways to actually describe thermodynamics and derive properties. Here with uh, Phil Simovich, we have uh, used Hamiltonian formalism and Euclidean pathological formalism. And we derived that in the case of regular black holes, we can have uh, a congruent thermodynamic quantities and a consistent description by uh, both formalisms. And there have been many results in the literature that have conflicting opinions about the proper thermodynamic quantities and how to deal with them. Uh, but here we proved some consistency. And we also showed that uh, they have a first law and a smart formula. Uh, and we treated the minimal length scale parameter as a as a thermodynamic parameter. So the first law describes the quasi-static, the difference between the internal uh, energy between a quasi-static transition between two equilibrium states. So here, the internal energy is played by the Comer mass. Uh, T is the temperature, S is uh, the entropy, which is calculated to be the beckinson hoffin entropy. Uh, phi is the conjugate potential to the minimal length scale L. And we have also the thermodynamic volume V, which is uh, conjugate to the pressure or tension, uh, which originates from the presence of a cosmological constant. Also, we showed that there is a smart formula and it's a linear smart formula. And we didn't have before that a, a proof. Uh, so usually when you have uh, an NED theory that doesn't admit the Maxwell limit, it's, there's no guarantee that this linear smart formula will exist. Uh, apparently it exists uh, for Hayward and Vardin model. For Cadoni model, we don't need to say anything because it admits the weak field limit, uh, which is natural. And uh, since we have the thermodynamic quantities, the, one of the things that we need to study is the phase structure of these uh, black holes. Uh, we studied the phase structure in both Minkowski and uh, the Sitter space times by introducing an isothermal cavity that will force and force actually the uh, thermal equilibrium. But here I will only consider the ADS case. And the ADS case is the most interesting case we can have because we know that from ADS CFT uh, correspondence that uh, if we have uh, a phase structure or a phase transition happening in the ADS bulk, then this will say something about the boundary CFT. So this is the most studied case. Uh, the ADS case is the most studied. So, Combining the thermodynamic quantities that we have derived, we get uh, an equation of uh, state, which is uh, it's a Van der Waals-like equation of state. Uh, it's not exactly a Van der Waals one, but there are deviations from it. And the denominator here is basically the reduced volume, where in the usual Van der Waals case represents the volume over the number of particles. And as for the phase structure, so we plot the we use we are doing the we are doing the phase structure in the canonical ensemble, and we are plotting parametrically the free energy with the temperature, and we use as a parameter uh, the horizon radius. So imagine uh, we are in the blue line. So we start from some small temperature, and we start increasing the temperature. If we have a mechanism like that, we will reach uh, this crossing point, and then in order to have uh, uh, thermal equilibrium, we need to minimize the free energy, so we will move downwards, and we have a small to large uh, phase transitions. transition. So the arrows represent actually the direction of increasing horizon radius. So if we start here, we are going downwards, and we have a small to large transition. As we start varying the minimal length scale, and specifically increasing it here, 
we will have a point, which is the black dot here, that the small, uh, the first order small to large phase transition terminates, and we have a critical point, and this is a second order phase transition. And this is the usual the usual behavior, the swallowtail behavior that we have in rice and nostrum, let's say, uh, plant holes. And we can actually uh, see the same feature by varying the cosmological constant and making making it smaller. So we see here that the Hawking phase transition is uh, not present. So this is reminiscent of what is happening to the rice and nostrum case when there is charge and the black hole cannot evaporate completely. So the same thing is happening here because of the presence of magnetic charge, but the presence of magnetic charge is inherently linked to the presence of the minimal length scale. So this effect can be seen um, as a quantum gravity effect, but only if we are using an effective description of uh, U1 gates field to serve as a regulator for the theory. And since we have a critical point, it is interesting to see what is happening with the behavior of thermodynamic quantities near the critical point. And usually this is done by critical exponents. And using these critical exponents, we can actually use, uh, uh, use to describe, uh, without considering microscopic uh, description, uh, some universality classes of uh, objects. So here we have uh, the heat capacity that scales with the reduced temperature which is given by uh, the temperature over the, the critical temperature, minus one. We have the difference between the, uh, the reduced volumes for the large and the small phase. We have the isothermal compressibility and the difference between critical pressure and pressure and volume with critical volume. We did the calculations and we retrieved the, the usual mean field theory exponents. Uh, which it's always surprising because the equation of state is not exactly one that So we have a deviation from it, but the critical exponents are exactly the same. But uh, we find a deviation from the mean field theory ratio. So typically when you consider a van der Waals-like fluid, you have a critical ratio, which is given by a combination of uh, the critical pressure, the reduced volume and the temperature, and it's three over eight. Here in this case, we find deviations from this ratio. And this can be traced back to the weak field limit of the NED theory or the asymptotic behavior. So you remember that the Cadoni model has a weak field limit, which is the Maxwell limit. And this leads to corrections to the usual Schwarzschild metric, which is one over R squared. And it's the stronger, the strongest deformations you can have. So the, when the weak field limit of the NED became a little bit stronger, then we have smaller corrections, this given by the Bardeen model. And then if it gets even stronger, the NED limit, then we have uh, less strong corrections for the Hayward model. And uh, we see that the larger the deformations from this as far as the geometry, the larger is the deviation from the minimal theory ratio, showing that the way we choose to regularize the singularity affects the deviation. And we will actually see that this has also an observable effect when we talk about light rings uh, later on. And since we have calculated the, the thermodynamic entropy and we found that, yeah, it's the Bekenstein uh, Hawking entropy, uh, it's also interesting to see what is happening with quantum corrections to this thermodynamic entropy. So we consider here a massless, minimally coupled scalar field. And uh, we can use the one-loop effective action to calculate using the Ricci scalar or the, the Ricci tensor or some components of the Riemann tensor, uh, what is the quantum corrections to the entropy. And this is actually the entanglement entropy of the field. And it's given by this form where uh, epsilon is a UV cutoff parameter. And we have the usual logarithmic curve that shows up when we calculate entanglement entropies. And we have a coefficient eta uh, in front of the logarithmic term. So this coefficient is given only um, by the derivatives of the metric function f evaluated on the horizon. And we see for these three models that we have uh, different behavior. So the Cardoni model and the Bardeen one have both uh, positive eta, while for the Hayward model, we will have uh, a length scale here that after that eta becomes negative. 
The dashed lines here represent the critical lengths up to which we are talking about a regular black hole and there are horizons. After that, we have an, an a horizon with ultra compact objects, and this uh, formula will not uh, apply. So for the Haywood model, it's exactly the same what behave, it's similar behavior to what we have for the Rice and Nostrum case when we start increasing the charge. So imagine now that we want these quantum corrections to add to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, and we want to actually maintain uh, the geometric form of the entropy. So uh, it has been done by Solodukin for the case of Rice and Nostrum and some other black holes. So we can always uh, redefine or renormalize if you want the gravitational constant and also the horizon radius. And we can maintain this geometric form for the entropy. And here we see that the parameter eta uh, actually shows up in the renormalization for the horizon radius. So this sign means that uh, the way we choose to regularize uh, the singularity affected actually the renormalization for the horizon radius. So for the Hayward model, after a critical length, you will see that the new radius will be smaller than initially. And it's also interesting to see if we can provide some constraints on the minimal length scale. So here I will assume that we have actually a small cosmological constant, which is the case. And we have uh, some, uh, we, we use the thermodynamic quantities in Minkowski space time. So with this, we can actually provide uh, a lower bound for the fraction L over N, and this is provided by thermodynamic stability. And in order to have thermodynamic stability, one needs to have a positive heat capacity, and it's represented by this region over here. So we can have a lower bound just by uh, demanding this. We can have an upper bound if we demand to have a trapped region. So if we want the trapped region, that means that the critical length is less than the, 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 the minimal length scale is le less than the critical length. So this provides an upper bound for this uh, ratio. And interestingly, this uh, is also okay with observational constraints. So Cadoni and his collaborators showed that uh, using the motion of the S to star around Sagittarius A uh, and using some uh, relations about the perihelium angle, uh, the precession of the perihelium angle, uh, that uh, there is an upper bound, which is 0 0.47, which allows for the possibility to have regular black holes, thermodynamically stable, and also, though, there is a gap between these two values, and that means that we can also have horizon results. And here I should emphasize that uh, just by looking at these relations, you can see that uh, the minimal length scale is not necessarily the Planck scale, the Planck length, it might be connected to the plant length, but it's not exactly that. It can have macroscopic values. And one of the distinctive features of ultra compact objects, uh, which, uh, with which I started my talk, uh, is the presence of light rings. So I will study here the behavior of light rings for uh, the case that our regular black holes or regular objects are sourced by NED theories. So in the presence of uh, NED theories, uh, we know that the superposition principle uh, does not hold anymore. And therefore, we will have uh, pro pro the propagating light to be affected by this background field. So usually, typically, when we have a nonlinear medium and you have an unpolarized ray, uh, and you send this right ray uh, in this medium, then you will see this ray splits into two. And this is because of the different phase velocity of the polarizations moving into this medium. This is the phenomenon of birefringence. So vacuum birefringence uh, has been uh, has been studied in the literature, but we don't have definitive evidence yet that it's an actual phenomenon. There have been some evidence with uh, magnetars and their strong magnetic fields, uh, but we are not certain that it exists. Uh, nevertheless, we, it is interesting to study what is happening when we source these regular black holes using these LED theories. And we actually find that this phenomenon happens and treating light as a perturbation, uh, just by taking the linear equations, one can find that the two polarizations of light move 
on different uh, metrics. One will move in the background metric and one will move in an effective metric given by uh, G bar here. And uh, by moving, I mean, if we want to maintain their null character, because one expects light rays to move in the background geometry and the effective description is just uh, a way to maintain uh, the light being null. So here uh, we have some important surfaces and we'll see how this paraphrases effect uh, affects the surfaces. So let's focus on the black line here. The black line here represents the outer horizon and the black dust line represents uh, the inner horizon. So as we said in the introduction, when we start increasing the minimal length scale, our plus and our minus will get closer and closer together until we reach this critical point when we have the extreme of black hole. And after that, there are no horizons anymore. So typically, if you choose to source these geometries without any D theories, you will have uh, only the blue light rings. So this solid blue line represents the outer light ring and the blue dust line represents the inner. So for the case of regular black hole, so imagine critical lengths behind that, behind that line, you see that only one light ring is present. The other one is hidden behind the horizon, therefore will not be observable. So we have one light ring in this case. And when the critical length gets larger than the, the minimal length gets larger than the critical one, then we will have two light rings. There are no horizons anymore. So both are visible. So this dust line here represents the inner stable light ring of ultra compact objects that is associated with uh, the instabilities linked to these objects. And this also in the case of pyrophysians, these blue lines will actually represent the light rings uh, of the background geometry. So now we have one more polarization to deal with in the case of uh, NED theories, and it's the red line, the red lines and the orange one. So one, the, the other polarization will create more light rings and we see that the other two here will merge at the critical point. But what we find most interesting is that one polarization has a light ring that persists for uh, all minimal length scale cell. And it exhibits a minimum here, and then it will start uh, increasing. So that means that we can have horizonless object actually with one light ring and no instabilities for uh, any decay cases at least. And I want to summarize all these results in uh, a table. So imagine now that we have a theory, which is uh, not NED, uh, 4D Gauss-Bonnet, for example. Then in this case, we will have the first line, and this will be the number of light rings for different critical lengths. So regular black holes will have one, and horizonless objects will have two, until the length when they will merge, the, the light rings will merge, and we'll have no more light rings. But in the uh, case where bifurgence is present, then we will have different numbers of light rings in comparison with the other cases. So the interesting thing here is that there are cases that the number of light rings is identical. So if, for example, you have uh, the means to actually observe the number of light rings, and let's say you see one light ring, then without knowing the underlying theory, you can't exactly say what the object is. If you see one, it might be a regular black hole without bifurgians, or it might be one with the presence of bifurgians and horizonless objects. Same thing can happen with two light rings. And this is quite interesting because uh, the knowledge of underlying theory is necessary to be able to say what, uh, from the number of light rings, what is the nature of the object that we see. And since all of this uh, phenomenon is beca because uh, of the different phase velocity of the polarizations, it will be interesting to see uh, how this phase velocity behave and what dispersion relations we get. So we assume here uh, that we have a polarization, uh, we have a propagation vector of this form, and we use eta uh, as a parameter to parameterize between radial and circular motion. And here we have a zero because we choose to move on the equatorial plane. 
So in the background geometry, uh, we have one polarization moving there. And in order to move there, we must have you know, the propagation vector to be now in this case. And just by calculating uh, this, we can find the dispersion relation, and we find that the phase velocity is square root of the phi. For the other polarization, uh, as we said, it's now in the affected geometry. So we use the propagation vector with the G bar metric. And this uh, actually gives us a new dispersion relation, which is given in this form. And it depends on the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to f and the field from f. And interestingly, we have a parameter here, uh, the parameter here, eta showing up. And you can see that for eta equals zero, these phase velocities will coincide. And for eta equals zero, we see that the propagation vector is radial. So for radial rays, we don't have this uh, splitting of light. We don't have the phenomenon of pyrophysians. But if we don't have radial propagation, then this will happen. And uh, here to demonstrate what is happening with the phase velocity, we used uh, with Sebastian the uh, Cadoni model, and we showed that uh, the radially propagating rays, which is the dark red line, has the higher phase velocity. And then we will have smaller and smaller phase velocities um, as we go in towards the eta pi over two, which represents the circular trajectories. And now I want to talk about uh, what, uh, what effect we have from the way we choose to regularize the singularities. Uh, we said earlier that uh, there is a deviation from the mini field theory ratio and dependent on that was dependent on the deformations from the Schwarzschild geometry. So this is evident here for the light rings. So here we have plotted the difference between uh, the polarization that moves in the affected geometry, the light ring that is created there, with the light ring of the background one. And the affected one has always a larger light ring. And here it's the region where L is very small. So in this region, we see that the difference scales as L squared for the Bardeen model and as L squared for the Hayward model. But for the Cadoni model, this difference scales linearly with L. And that means that the, when the deformations from this geometry is stronger, then the difference between the light rings will be much more evident in the Cadoni model for small minimal length scales L. And with this, I will end the static scenarios and I will proceed with the dynamic ones. And first of all, I want to talk about the framework that we're going to study these dynamic cases. And here we consider uh, spherically symmetric cases in, spheric, in semi-classical gravity. So we will have the, the Einstein tensor and this will be sourced by a renormalized energy momentum tensor in some quantum state uh, psi. And we also make two additional assumptions. We want to have finite formation time according to a distant observer. And we also want finite curvature scalars on the apparent horizon. So assuming all of this, uh, Mann, Mark, and Terno show that uh, we can only have for dynamical cases two possible solutions if we want real value solutions. And this will be evaporating future horizons, so evaporating black holes only or accreting uh, anti-trapping horizons, which means accreting white holes. And these uh, features I'm going to use later on for the description of the apparent horizons of uh, regular black holes, assuming that semi-classical gravity is valid in their vicinity, in the vicinity of the horizons. Uh, also, we have uh, extended this framework in actual symmetry with the study of curve idea metric. Uh, this was done in the second paper. Uh, here, and, and uh, we have also studied these type of models in cosmological space-time. So we have successfully embedded uh, metrics like, like that in the presence of a cosmological constant. And we have actually showed that uh, under these assumptions, uh, cosmological coupling is not possible. So I'm going to focus with the description of black holes. So the best coordinate system to use for the description of black holes, and by best I mean the one that is not singular at the horizons, is uh, of this form, the advanced coordinates. 
And we have the most general case with two functions, H plus and F, that uh, describe the space time. And under the assumptions we described in the previous slide, we find that H plus must have an expansion uh, around the outer horizon, which is R plus here of this form. So we see that this H plus will vanish on the horizon. But uh, we will assume for later on that H plus will always be zero because I will just assume some uh, dynamical generalization of the models we talked previously and one additional model without mass inflation. So the other function is F, which can be described in an invariant way uh, like that, where we have introduced a function C that can also be expanded in a unique way uh, like that, where R plus is the outer horizon and W1 is the linear coefficient of its expansion. And this is uh, uh, a very important quantity as we will see later on for thermodynamics. And C over two is the mission sharp mass, which is a notion of energy enclosed uh, inside uh, radius R. And now we'll proceed with the time evolution of um, regular black holes. And for regular black holes, we need to have uh, at least two horizons. So we have here an inner horizon R minus, and we have an inner horizon R plus. And this is uh, one of the most general ways to actually describe the metric function. G is a positive function introduced to regularize the space time appropriately and also provide the asymptotic limits the way we want them to be. The exponents a and b represent the degeneracy of uh, r minus and r plus. So with, uh, with Sebastian, we have, pro we, will, we have studied this particular metric for the general case, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to restrict in a simpler case. So we will, we will make these assumptions that we have a trapped region, we don't want mass inflation, and that means that we need to choose a degenerate inner horizon. And we also want a non-zero temperature of the outer horizon. So we want a non-degenerate outer horizon. Under these assumptions, this is the simplest uh, metric. So A must be three and B must be one. And a model like that was actually studied by Visser and collaborators for uh, curing the mass inflation instabilities, at least the classical ones. So uh, let's focus on the Penrose diagram here. So we have a formation point. At the formation point here, R plus and R minus are uh, equal. And it's the, uh, the instant, the time instant that we have these horizons emerging. And under the assumptions that we said earlier, the framework we're working on says that we can only have evaporating inner horizons. And in this case, that means that once these horizons are born, they have to evaporate through the entire lifetime until they re-emerge again, the point T where it's the disappearance of the trapped region. So that means that R minus and R plus are both time-like uh, horizons for, uh, for the entire lifetime uh, if we assume that some classical gravity is valid in their vicinity. In, since we have studied the dynamical evolution, it's interesting to see what is happening with energy conditions. So energy conditions is a way to describe if we have exotic matter or to actually quantify the presence of quantum effects. So here we have uh, calculated for the model I showed earlier under dynamical evolution, what is happening to the null energy condition. We took the outgoing null vector and we find that it's uh, it has this specific form just depending on the minus derivative of f with respect to the advanced time. And we find that the null energy condition is violated in the vicinity of the outer horizon, the red region here, and it is satisfied in near the inner horizon. And that means that there is a boundary. So there is a boundary of the neck which is located inside the trap region and it effectively splits it into two parts, one uh, non-violating and one violating one. But uh, instead of only considering what are the regions of violation, we will actually we, we actually want to see um, how much is violated. So for the inner horizon, we found that um, the energy condition is marginally satisfied. It's always zero. 
Uh, this is an effect of, of the degeneracy of the inner horizon. But if you will calculate that for a dynamical uh, Hayward model or Bardeen model, you will find that this is uh, positive. So for the outer horizon, uh, things are much more interesting. You can see the violation of the null energy condition. And you actually see that close to the evaporation point, we will have the maximal violation. And this is actually uh, means that uh, quantum effects are much more prominent in this region. It means that uh, quantum properties are much more interesting near the evaporation of the trap region. And since we're talking about dynamical cases, and we said that both horizons are time-like, then light can escape. We can show that the light will escape into in timescales that are similar to the evaporation timescale, but it can escape. And it's interesting to see, though, what is happening with massive particles. So I'm going to consider here uh, radially moving uh, massive particles. So they will have a Lagrangian of uh, this form. And the derivatives here represent derivative with respect to proper time. And we have uh, the normalization condition, the time-like condition. And from this condition, one can derive two solutions for V dot, one with plus and one with minus. So V dot must be positive. And the demand to have real value solutions means that this quantity here must be non-negative. And we want to implement and these conditions uh, for the trajectory of an outgoing moving initially uh, massive part. So for the untrapped region, we have F being positive, and both ingoing and outgoing trajectories are described by these relations here. Both will have the plus sign, while on the trapped region, inside the trapped region, F is negative, and R dot is also negative for both ingoing and outgoing rays. And in order to maintain P dot being positive, we need to have ingoing having plus and outgoing having minus. So imagine now that we have a spaceship and we are near the center and we want to exit the trap region. So we start on an outgoing trajectory being described by uh, the plus sign relation. And if we want to, we want to calculate what is the acceleration near the uh, inner apparent horizon. So as we approach, we see that we have this formula where R prime minus is negative. So as we approach on an outgoing trajectory, this is negative and divergent. And this will create R, the velocity, to be smaller and smaller until we reach the triangle, where R dot is basically zero. And that means that we have a transition to an ingoing trajectory. Once this happened, imagine that we are very close to the inner horizon on an ingoing trajectory, and the inner horizon can actually overtake us, and we can actually find ourselves inside the trap region. So this crossing happened on an ingoing trajectory. Our, uh, our, the acceleration will be still will still be negative and will start decreasing, but our dot cannot be less uh, this for, for the for this ingoing trajectory because we want to maintain the reality of the solutions. So once we reach this value, then a transition will happen to an outgoing one by having the minus sign showing up in V dot. And this actually represents in this figure, this dust orange line. And this will be the evolution after that for R dot. And you see that initially it will decrease. And after that, it will start increasing because the acceleration now is basically positive as we approach the out the outer horizon. Once we reach R dot being minus square root of minus F, it happens at this point, and it's, it coincides with this, we will have a transition and ingoing trajectory inside the trap region. And then again, the outer horizon can overtake us and we can be outside the trap region and be on an outgoing trajectory and actually escape. So uh, the spaceship can be free, uh, but the horizon crossing can only happen on an ingoing trajectory. Uh, and there is this unique way to escape for time-like particles. And again, as you see, the, this escape will happen actually in time scale similar to the evaporation time scale. And the last uh, part, the, the last uh, thing that I want to study is thermodynamics. 
And study of thermodynamics in dynamical space times is actually uh, difficult because we don't have any killing vectors anymore. We don't have a killing vector associated with time translations symmetry. Uh, but we have uh, a generalization of this, which is actually the Kodama vector. And this vector is associated with a, a charge. And this charge is the mission shark mass. So I want to remind you that this was the there were the relations that we had. And for all dynamical regular black holes, we have the W1 is different than zero. And I'll, I'll talk about this in the next slide. And we derived a form for the first law has uh, this, partic this particular relation here. Actually, the dynamical first law has first been derived by Hayward in um, 1998. Uh, but here we have uh, an expression based only on the near horizon geometry. And this actually applies to much more general cases than regular black holes. Uh, but I want to focus in this uh, case. So the difference with the first law that we saw in the static cases is that now the internal energy is played by the uh, mission start mass evaluated on the horizon. So from the energy enclosed in the trap region, you have a notion for the temperature, which is given by the Kodama surface gravity and W1 plays a role in this. So you see that when W1 is zero, we get the usual Schwarzschild temperature. And for the entropy is A over four. And we have a pressure term here, which is minus W1. Uh, w dependent W1. So W1 basically depends on the minimal link scale L. So you can see for all these three models, W1 is proportional to minimal link scale L. And if we have a regular space time, then W1 is different than zero. And these pressure terms are, uh, they have their origin in the regularized space. So for L equals zero, W1 is zero, and we have the usual Schwarzschild. And I would like to uh, mention some thoughts. So what are the ultra covalent objects that we see? Uh, are they regular black holes? Do they have the horizons or the horizonless object? Uh, we don't know yet. Um, is it possible to distinguish them from the number of light rings or quasi-normal modes without uh, the knowledge of underlying theory? Uh, it, this is also uh, a nice question to ask. Um, is What is a good effective description of such objects in the absence of a, a good quantum gravity theory? And uh, probably NED theory is not a good effective description. Uh, it shows peculiar features. And uh, the other question I have is what is happening to the end of the evaporation process? Because we saw that there is a unique way for the evaporation to stop. And this is by having the outer and inner horizon to merge. And that means that the evaporation should end with an extremal uh, regular black hole of zero temperature. And this signifies a violation of the third law of black hole mechanics because we have a finite sequence of operations that actually leads to a zero uh, temperature state. And uh, this is my group, uh, photograph taken here at Macquarie, uh, Phil Simovic, um, um, Sebastian Mark at OIST, uh, Pravin de Hall at uh, CSIRO in Melbourne, uh, Daniel Terno, uh, Sam Sayamzida Maharana, and Rama Vedapali, which are our PhD students. And this will be a summary of my results and the QR code for my Inspire page. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was a very, very uh, interesting and wonderful talk. Do we have any uh, questions from uh, those in the Zoom? Um, yeah. Um, nice talk, Yanis. Um, I must have uh, sort of missed it slightly, but um, you kept talking about minimum length. Could you tell me what that exactly means? Sorry, what? So you, you, in your models, you often have a minimum length, you said. What exactly yeah. does that mean? The minimal length scale uh, is an effective way to regularize uh, the singular space-time. So uh, you, uh, you can imagine that um, here it's originated from the magnetic charge, but you can actually imagine that it comes from a quantum gravity theory 
for example, um, having a mini super space, for example, can be something that creates a, an infrared length, and you can have that, or, or restrict fields in this particular space, or having a discretization. It's going to have multiple origins, but in this case, we are treating it, we are treating it completely classically. So we have a chart, and this chart creates a minimal length. And 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 you say that this length, is clear. yeah, this length you say could be possibly larger than the Planck length, though it doesn't necessarily have to be yeah. Planck length. Okay. So uh, I'll show you. Um, so when we introduced the magnetic charge, we had the dependence, uh, for example, here, M and L. So these parameters can actually be rescaled and we can have a larger minimal length scale. But this, so we can actually um, uh, rescale here uh, M and L, and you can actually have a larger minimal length scale if you want. But this is a feature of the magnetic charge and the way we choose to, um, to classically, let's say, regularize the singularity. Uh, but uh, minimal length scale can be given by uh, constraints. And this, for example, I showed you that. Um, let me go back to the constraints. So here, for example. So if you take the mass here to be uh, Sagittarius A, you can actually find the minimal length scale, introduce the Newton's constant as well, and have full dimensions for everything. And you will find that L has a macroscopic value. And then this is directly provided by observational constraints. So Cadoni took uh, the model that uh, I described with the Maxwell limit and started trajectories of this model and showed that the precession angle is dependent linearly on the minimal length CLL. So using actual observational data and modeling Sagittarius A as a, as a regular black hole, spherically symmetric, this might be ideal, but uh, this is what he did. And it goes this upper limit. And this upper limit means that we can have macroscopic values of L. So L can be proportional to the Planck scale, for example, but here in this model, you will have some macroscopic values. Okay. I don't know if that was clear. There yeah, are two yeah. ways that you can think of that. It's either that, or you can actually think that it's the Planck scale or uh, a length scale that. Um, Quantum effects are so important that GR could fail. Both have been in the literature, uh, but here I choose the way that this can be a macroscopic length. But that left-hand limit, the thermodynamic stability limit, that would make L larger than the Planck scale. Am I reading that right? Um, yeah, here. Yeah. So. Here, L is bounded in microscopic values. Here, it's about microscopic values. So you can imagine L being a Planck length, for example, if you want to imagine it like that. Right, thanks. And the thermodynamic stability is, uh, is provided by the fact that uh, the, the heat capacity must be positive here. Yep. And the other assumption is that if we actually want to have regular black holes with trapped region. Otherwise, you don't need this bound here. You can just use the observational bound, which might include also a horizontal subject. The interesting thing here is that we can, we actually have these limits being inside what we have from observations. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, I have one other one. Yeah, I've, oh, I had oh, one, Nico. Sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to follow up on your question about what is that minimum length. Um, I mean, I think the motivation for it is because we actually work with an explicit model by our yeah. team that has a minimum length in the fields, and so we mm -hmm. can see exactly how it shows up. Is there something more than just you throw in the term that that is responsible for that minimum length? I mean, is there an actual model at play, or is it just something that you just kind of throw in by fiat? 
So uh, most models started by just putting this by hand and uh, actually demanding to have this uh, regular space time. Uh, but there have been models by uh, Astekar and other people showing that in loop quantum gravity with discretization, you can actually have this uh, kind of models and we can actually have ba uh, bounces and other stuff. And this uh, shows up uh, in these cases. But we haven't actually okay, so much on these cases. Um, right, right. But but I'm I guess what I'm hearing there is that the the initially they just threw it in, but it turns out that there are explicit models that, that for which that arises. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there are, and there are also collapse models that can have this minimal length uh, showing up okay. by having some quantum effects during the collapse or modeling coping radiation as trace anomaly. There are heaps of models that actually describe okay. this length showing up. Okay, great, thank you. No worries. All right, uh, my second question was gonna be about your polarization models or slides. More or less, it's just going to be what, in which directions are this polarization is taking place? Because if this is meant to be an isotropic universe, I'm not exactly sure what that means here. Yeah, here the theory is not isotropic. You can actually uh, see that the NED theory has different behavior in different directions. So that creates uh, uh, this polarization. How do you, how do you define these directions? The directions. So basically, you have uh, you take the 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 description of the field and you start expanding this into the four independent vectors that you can have. Uh, one of them will be the propagation vector that it gets eliminated in the derivation because it is vertical to the to polarization, and the other the other vector will have exactly the same, and we are left only with two vectors that represent the polarization. So doing that, you can actually find that uh, in order to have now propagation vector, one of the polarizations should have background geometry and one should have an affected one. Uh, that's how the derivation goes. Uh, there are papers from the 90s that have done this, if you were interested. Um, so technically, you have an F mu nu field. You have uh, an F mu nu bar field imagine. You have an F mu nu which describes the background, and you have the propagating light as a perturbation in that. In that. You apply the equations that uh, in this background, and you find that in linear order, you can have an equation that describes the propagation, and then you can describe the field, and then you can actually expand it into specific vectors, and you can show that this. Uh, effectively shows it. Okay. Nico, so did that answer your question? Because I wasn't I Sorry? wasn't clear on exactly what so the, the uh, it was not clear to me what is determining the different polarization directions. Um maybe you said it, but like what is what is the physics there? What what physical object is determining the direction of one so polarization it's a, gauge field. It, Sorry? it's a gauge field so you will have two polarizations so uh you have two directions oh, sure but well, if but you have do you, you the direction do you choose the direction or do you um basically so how, you're left with two polarizations how do you define which is which is it something you define or is it something which you, the you, can, you, can take the value you, show, you can actually show that which polarization you choose and you can choose specific vectors i don't remember exactly now what was the polarization that moves in one and what moves in the other but uh, you can show by taking specific values but is there some sort of diagram you could draw or or something that shows us which so here's here's the problem with with my understanding of what you said you said there are two polarizations. Well, yes, there are horizontal and vertical, diagonal, anti diagonal, or wh whatever you have sure, in, sure. in thinking of light. Fine. Yes. But I mean, if you're t saying that one polarization moves at a different speed than the other, then you can't just pick whatever basis you want. 
And the question is, what physical reference frame determines which uh, one goes faster than the other? Uh, the, the description is being done in the spatial coordinate here, so I guess the observer will be someone infinity, and this is not uh, done by a specific observer. So either you accept that uh, one polarization will move at a different velocity and you will have a time-like light moving, or you will accept that uh, the NED theory is not a good effective description for such thoughts. So, yeah, maybe maybe the question maybe the question isn't clear. I think what yeah, I, what we're saying is if you it, like what is breaking the symmetry? The the, the anisotropy of the field is what breaks the symmetry here. Pretty much. Okay. And so then, maybe you can you don't remind us what is creating the anisotropy in the field. So you have a an NED Lagrangian, and if you actually calculate the energy momentum tensor of this field, you will see that the components are. Uh, different in different directions. Uh, so you'll have different oh. pressures, for example, or something like that. So it's built into the nonlinear electrodynamics. Sure, yeah, everything is built there. Yeah. Uh, I see. So if you I don't have any and you choose something else, then yeah, this will not be an effect. Okay. Well, that's that's good for me. Uh, Nico, I, I, I kind of jumped in there, but I had a similar question. So no, did, did that answer? I think it's working, yeah. That, that's good. Okay, well, I'm out of questions. Okay. I don't think we've got any more questions then. So uh, maybe we can just wrap up. Thank you very much for presenting, um, Johannes. It was very, uh, very interesting to see. Wow. Thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, for attending. Thank Thanks. you. All. That was great. Bye. Thanks. See you everyone. See you.